So okay. apologies because it started quite quickly. I was, wasn't quite ready to start recording. Oh, sorry. Do you want? Um, do we need to go back and start again? Um, everything up to this point wasn't recorded. Um, so if you need it for your minutes, then you may need to go back to the beginning. Sorry about that. David, is it appropriate because we've only taken the minutes and apologies? Is it okay to press on? Or I think we, I think uh, for the purpose of the minutes, there's, there's no need. Uh, we, we, if we could just, um, if we just go back to, to just confirm the apologies, so just for the sake, sake of completeness, so that's okay. So apologies to everyone. Okay, do you want to just record the apologies for absence again, David? Yes, so um, the apologies uh, received uh, were from um, Heidi Phillips, Paul Dalton and Ken Hughes. Okay, lovely, thank you. And um, if we go through the, um, the draft minutes of the Audit and Assurance Committee meeting held on the 12th of April, I think I got to about page seven. Um, so if we just go through eight, nine and ten, um, and can I confirm that those are an accurate reflection? Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, <clears throat> and the action log um, from the 12th of April, David. Yes, thank you, Chair. So with regards to uh, the action log, I just confirmed that the um, majority of the actions have been completed. Um, just draw your attention to the action relating to the um, questionnaire for the committee effectiveness. Um, we've um, extended the deadline to enable um, all board members and everybody uh, who attend the committee to be able to respond to the questionnaire. So we'll take that paper now in June rather than at uh, this meeting. Um, and just to confirm that the Anne report for this committee um, will uh, is on the agenda today for consideration, hopefully for approval to the board. Um, could I just add, Chair, just for the sake of um, completeness, that uh, we haven't received um, any declarations of interest with regards to this meeting. Thank you. Oh, th thank you, David. Thank you for um, <coughs> going back to that. Um, <coughs> and when is the new deadline for the um, submissions? Well, I would need Cathy to please confirm that, but the, the next meeting of the uh, committee is at the beginning of June, so I think we've got, we should have more than enough time to... to, to Submit the answers. Kathy, have you got the, uh, the answer? Should we confirm after the meeting? I think we've already had one deadline, so I would su suggest that if we're looking for um, further submissions, that we close in a, a week or so. Okay. So, shall we extend that, therefore, to the, if we haven't already communicated, to the 12th of June? Yeah. Is that okay with everybody? Can you um, yes. submit? Um, your your views so primarily um you've got the independent members it's um um we usually ask for internal audit external audit and counter fraud to submit as well is that right david that's correct so that we get get as complete a response as possible well. yeah. so if i could ask um if you could take a look at that and um submit that would be great thank you Can i just check that deadline did you say the 12th of june did you mean may yeah. Apologies, Sorry. I did mean me. That's okay. Just wanted <laughs> to right. Thank Sorry. You. <laughs> Thank you for the clarification. Thanks, Emma. Okay, so um, are there any matters arising from the minutes um, that anybody wants to raise that aren't covered by the agenda today? No. Okay, lovely. Thank you. Um, so we'll move on to part two matters for consideration. Um, move on to the head of internal audit opinion and annual report and Emma I think um, you're going to present this to us today. I am, I am indeed yes you got myself presented today I'm going to take the report as read so I'm not going to go through it page by page and word by word but I'll just draw out some of the key points from it so as the report title suggests it is the um, report of the 21-22 annual internal audit report that incorporates the head of audit's opinion it is in draft at the moment um, we finalized in time for the, um, the next set of meetings and there are a number of pieces of work that we have still got out in draft so there's just a few sort of tweaks to be made to it, notwithstanding any comments that might come back from today. Um, so I so say the, the report incorporates the head of audit's opinion for the year and as outlined in section 1.2 and 2.2 of the report, 
the head of audit's opinion is there as one of the assurance mechanisms that's available for the chief executive uh, as the accountable officer, which can then feed into the organisation's annual governance statement. So the content of the report draws upon the work that we've done throughout the year and has been reported already through this committee, notwithstanding those few couple of pieces that are still in draft. Um, table one of the report sort of summarises what, what those pieces of work are and the spread of the work in terms of the assurance ratings. Um, so I won't go through each of those in any detail because all of those reports have already come through to committee. Um, in addition to that, so there's one that went out in draft yesterday and there's another one that will hopefully go out in draft today and that will be the, the programme work done for the year then. So when determining the overall opinion, the head of audit will draw upon the individual opinions that have come from each of those reports. But we'll also draw upon other knowledge and factors um, such as the process for implementing recommendations and the committee's monitoring of those, but also draw on um, information from third parties. Um, for example, work done by NWSSP's internal auditors and DHCW's internal auditors where there might have been implications for HIW and that's set out in section three of the report. However, it's worth noting at this point, nothing's been drawn to our attention from those pieces of work they've done that are specific to HIW. Um, so the basis of the opinion is set out in section 2.4 um, and that shows that we've uh, provided a reasonable assurance um, and just to sort of make that clear then, so the board can take reasonable assurance that arrangements to secure governance, risk management and internal control within the areas under review are suitably designed and effectively applied. There's some areas that require management attention in control design or compliance with low to moderate impact on the residual risk until resolved. So that's the overall opinion that we've given. Um, this just a couple of other points I was going to just draw out was um, in section uh, page 13 of the report, oh no, it's my page 13, sorry, it draws attention to our compliance with the public sector internal audit standards. So as an audit and assurance function, we are audited in effect every five years. Um, we've got another review due next year, but as it stands, we are in the category of generally conforming with the public sector internal audit standards, which is not a nice phrase, it's a bit like our reasonable assurance, it's not the nicest of phrases, but it means we're doing the right job. Um, also, all of our work is also subject to quality checks by the Director of Audit and Assurance. And the last thing I was just going to draw attention to was the section in table 4.2, which outlines our performance against some of the KPIs, which are common KPIs across all of the health boards and trusts across Wales. Um, and then these are the results for HIW. So in the main, they're all green. There is just the one that's amber. But I think because of the low number of reports that we produce for you each year, it doesn't take much for it to tip into an amber. So. Um, so yeah, that's, that was sort of the main points I was going to draw out, unless there's any specific questions. And as I say, it is in draft. There are some bits in there in yellow because they are bits that we will need to update before a final version is produced. Thank you, Emma. That's, that's great. Um, Jonathan, did you have any comments? Just say a very big thank you for the report. It, it is very comprehensive and uh, certainly covers um, you know, all the things I'd expect to see in there. So thank you very much for, for presenting it and for the way in which it's been pulled together. Just a quick question really, I think just in terms of where this report sits compared to previous years. Um, obviously you've outlined uh, a reasonable level of assurance, which is which is okay. Obviously I, I, I want to see substantial assurance. I'm sure we'll be heading in that, in that direction. How does it compare on the overall assurance level compared to, to previous years? From memory, for the few years that obviously HIW has been in existence, it's always been in a reasonable assurance category. And if I'm honest with you, if you look at the very the last appendix B of the report, which gives the assurance ratings, the definition of a substantial assurance is quite tight. And it means that there's sort of within all the different work that we've done in the year, there's got to be very few matters arising. And so actually, I, if I'm honest with you, I don't know any organisation that ever gets to a substantial assurance. It's nice to aspire to, but I think you'd have to have, ev have to have everything perfect in every audit and everything that we do over a year in order to sort of start hitting into that category. So I'd say HOW are always going to probably be reasonable, but a top reasonable. It's almost like we need a barometer within that reasonable bracket in itself, really. So, but yeah, yeah, it's, yeah it's, it's exactly where it has been for the last few years. And enough, that was exactly my question. <laughs> <laughs> which was how do we get to substantial and does any I was going to ask you the question does anybody get substantial because I can't remember ever seeing it in all my years but um 
But um, I mean, I'm I'm very hard. I, I mean, I I want to thank internal audit formally. I think, um, as Jonathan has said, for delivering on on the program. I know we um, go up, um, ask from time to time for um, assurance that you're going to complete the program, and and you know that it, it, it's a sort of as the chairman would say, an, an adequate. Uh, <laughs> Um, performs coming, you know, nearly done by the beginning of May, given all the, the circumstances is, is um, commendable. So, um, so well done for that. And um, also well done to all the officers, because um, whilst it is reasonable assurance, as Jonathan says, we've got quite a lot of substantial assurance reports in there. <clears throat> and so, you know, it doesn't take a fantastic mathematician does it to work out that we must be at the high end of reasonable um, but I can see as I was going through the different audit reports that there are some things that clearly would peg us back you know we do have some recommendations and we do still have some things outstanding that we haven't haven't nailed so so I think I you know I'm I'm content with that but um but well done certainly to officers because um that's as good as good as I've seen um in in terms of an opinion I've also realized David that um whilst we're working through all these um different ways of working that chairing remotely is the first time probably we've done it with people in the room and I can't see hands in the room <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know how I pick up if anybody in the room has got a question. Can you make somebody suggest how I might be able to do that apart from the way? I will. I will keep an arm on the room, but I'd ask people to not be subtle when raising their arms. That um, it would be acceptable to wave both arms if, you, if, we, if we don't pick up any. So we'll okay, look. sort of look like an SOS if you want. To say. It, because it might, it's much know, harder than the yellow yellow hand, isn't it? Yeah, because you're quite small on my screen, um, and I really can't see people at the end of the table. So you will have to. Ah, there we are. A hand went up then. Okay, sorry, yeah. Down on Martin, we, we moved here because we couldn't get the camera to sort of pan out to be able to see us when we were closer so we will if you can see that that's uh, yeah well now you've um now you've come in Rhiannon I I can actually ask is there anything you wanted to say on internal audit um only I suppose to to second the thanks for all the work that they've done and um you know in support of the organization and in I guess being positive in, in recommending improvements that we can take forward yeah so thank you great thank you i'll pass the so, thanks on to the team yeah thank you emma that would be good um so that's we're going to delay the um digital report aren't we the internal audit until later in the agenda is that yeah um so that whichever suits you jill i mean martin's here now and can do it now or it's up to you entirely oh sorry i thought that had been arranged sorry no uh, that's fine it is yeah yeah, yeah. So, um, because Sean's here for the digital part, and I think it would be very useful. Um, you can help, Jenna, if you wanted to do it now, more than happy to. Oh, thank you, Sean. Okay, all right. Let's. Um, where is it on the agenda now, though? I think it's already moved, hasn't it? But um, if, if you'd like to do it now, then Martin, go go ahead. That would be fine. Fair enough. That's a surprise for me. I was there. Uh... Relaxing into the meeting, yeah. Oh, well, no, <laughs> no <I'm> joking. <laughs> um, yeah, so thanks for that, Chair. So, this was um, an advisory review looking at um, how well positioned Hugh is to um, make the most of digital technology. The basis of the review was um, we did a review of literature um, on successful, dig successful digital transformations, identified, identified signifiers of good practice from those successful transformations within organizations. Um, and from that, we set out six key questions <clears throat> to assess kind of where Hugh was in relation to those. So the six key questions were, is the organization reimagining service delivery and business process? Is the organization redefining the relationship to the service user? Is the organization leveraging the wider ecosystem in health and social care? Do staff have the right technical skill set and mindset for digital? Um, do organization, does the organization have leaders who see the bigger picture uh, for digital? digital? 
And does your organization have a system for prioritization of digital transformation initiatives? And we also looked at the impact of some of the known barriers to successful digital transformation, um, such as the lack of a corporate vision, a lack of a proper digital culture, the lack of ability to experiment with digital, um, digital technologies, um, legacy systems, lack of skills, lack of budget, cybersecurity issues, um, <clears throat> the existence of silos within an organization and legacy system, oh, sorry, and um, the link between digital directorate and the um, business services. So overall, the way it came out is um, Hugh is quite well positioned to um, take forward the use of digital technology, especially given the type of services that you provide across Wales and the fact you are an all Wales provider. Um, over the last year or so, the um, digital vision has been taking shape. The digital directorate has been restructured <clears throat> and bolstered and the links to the business side have improved. Um, along with the ownership of digital um, within the services being increased. And the creation of the, of the Digital Transformation Leadership Group helps um, facilitate that. There's also a number of areas within here where services are being redefined and redesigned to make the most of digital technology. And in those areas, particularly the ownership of the digital um, process is um, increasing. <clears throat> There's also been work to increase the cross-boundary digital flow um, and links and networking across Wales and with academia have improved. <clears throat> and there's a process in place for services to request digital projects and digital feed-in, and digital is included in the IMTP. There were some areas where we noted that improvements could be made to um, enhance how digital is used going forwards. I guess the key ones there are um, ensuring that each director has a digital champion that can act as a link between the service and the users and digital, so they need to be aware of what digital can, digital can do and how the service wants to operate. Um, linked to that is ensuring that services fully link with their users to identify their needs and wants and ideas. <clears throat> and then um, linked to that again is increasing the awareness of digital pot potential and ownership. So the directorate and services understand that digital is now something that belongs to them and they influence rather than the old kind of perspective of IT being something done by IT that's done to them. Um, a couple of the other things we noted that, um, for improvement was to develop a target operating model once the digital strategy or digital and data strategy is being finalized um, and to agree and finalize the digital performance framework and then to increase and improve work on um, partnership development to kind of maximize the existence of digital skills from without the organization and kind of co-creation of small digital projects. Um, so that, in a crux, in a, that's the crux of it. It's quite a big report, so I don't want to spend uh, all day talking about it, but I'm happy to take any questions if you want. Thank you, Martin. It's very um, helpful. Sean, did you want to come in for <coughs> On, on this? Yeah, um, I, I guess to start with thank you, Martin, I think the exercise was a really good um, way of setting the scene of where we've come, and I think it does demonstrate in the last um, 12 um, months, 18 months, we've made significant progress and really changed the position of digital within the organisation. I think um, the future and the opportunity is recognised. Um, many of the things actually already identified are a key part of our deliverable plan for this year. So some of this was no surprises in, in, in some respect. Um, this, uh, the delivery of the digital strategy is a strategic objective for this year's IMTP. Um, and lots of this will already be in that plan. So I, I guess I'm keen to demonstrate the achievement of this action plan through the delivery of the digital strategy now and not have it as a separate thing. I think you'll be able to see as we present that back through um, that the progress is being made. We've already made quite considerable progress even the last six weeks with the digital champion roles and taking those forward. Uh, and the piece about um, really glad that the improved governance and co-working with the directors has been recognized and we will continue to build on that now through the next um, 12 months. I think in relation to the target operating model, we have done a fair piece of work of that with our move to, move to the cloud. Um, I think the target operating model in a digital sense 
constantly needs to be reviewed and um, we think we can demonstrate some of that and, and that will continue to happen now as we change the, the landscape of digital within the organization but i was quite um pleased with the report and i think it really aligned to our vision of the strategy and the plans of both operational and strategic we've got outlined for the next um well definitely the next year but probably longer than that as well so Thank you, Martin. Anyway, it was really good to hear that, some of that coming back, that we've made that progress. I think the one thing to say is whilst to audit committee, we've been presenting more in relation to the cyber and the IG, um, we will make sure now that we're presenting more around our digital position um, um, in, a bit, in a more focused uh, position, not just through this audit, but as we progress with the strategy as well. Thanks, Sean. That's, that's really helpful. And I thought as I read the report, there was huge synergy with uh, what we were doing. So really pleased um, to see that. It, it's, it's good to get a, um, an external view or an internal audit view on, on things. And um, it's good that it, it, it looked um, very much along the lines that, as you say, that, that we're progressing. So look, really exciting agenda, I think, the digital agenda. Um, Jonathan, did you have any any comments? Just a couple of points, uh, Chair. If I can just firstly, can I can I thank Martin for the, the report uh, again? You know, really detailed and really well thought through. I thought in terms of explaining mm. the rationale behind the recommendations. And Sean, thank thanks for obviously you know including the management response in the way that you have, and you know clearly putting quite quite tight timescales really around the yes. implementation of the recommendations, which is which which is great. Um, I think what would be useful, I think, just as we go through you know, the next 12 months, obviously some of these are recommendations from implementation by March of next year, um, is, is for us to have that understanding of as to the, the so what. So Martin, in his report, has, has, has indicated why the recommendations are useful and the impact that they should have. But then for us to be able to judge, well, have they had that impact you know, as, we, as we look through the next 12 months and how, as you said, that aligns to the to the overall um, strategic direction, particularly within obviously in digital, the alignment with the, uh, the IMTP in particular. So I think it will be useful, um, you know, to see how how this works. Has it worked perhaps in the way that uh, Martin and colleagues anticipated that it should work uh, and, and therefore to be able to judge the impact that these recommendations have. But no, I, I think you've given yourselves a very tight set of deadlines. So well done for that. It's ambitious. <laughs> I think on the, on the deadline piece, um, because there was so much synergy with the recommendations and what we were already doing, we had some of that in trail anyway. Um, so I can give a bit of confidence on the deadline because we have already started at the back end of last calendar year to be ready to get into that position and on our planning. So it did work out quite closely to what we had in, in store. So they are... Um, realistic deadlines based on where we are and the work programme we had um, and our work on the champions has, has already started and our move to digitalisation through maximising office and Microsoft Vibes sort of in train as we speak so yeah it, it's um, it's really helpful to package it in that way. Thank you. Thank you. Just, just a quickie, um, were people keen to be champions? Is, is this an agenda that they really want to take forward in the organisation? We had good responses. I think this is one that will grow as um, you see, go back to Jonathan's point a bit, because as people see the art of the possible, we will gather champions along the way, I think, and as it means more to them individually in their departments and in their pieces of work. But we have had good initial coverage. And the piece that we're starting that with is the SharePoint um, migrations and the increase in the use of Microsoft 365, because I think for the nature of a non-patient facing organization, Microsoft 365 is a lot of potential and we need to work with the DHCW Center of Excellence now to really capitalize on that. Yeah. Good. Okay, lovely. We'll look forward to um, hearing progress. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, okay, so if we move on then now to the review of the draft accounts um, and um, I'll ask Rhiannon and Martin um, to present. Thanks. Um, so, my short presentation, Kathy's going to put on screen, um, which we think means you'll be able to see that and not us. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. 
probably able to see the top of my head, actually. Um, so just, I think, to just run through a couple of slides to give everybody a feel for um, I suppose the, the accounts that we're presenting and pull out some of the sort of key information that, that tells the story of the, the year that we've just um, completed. So we have um, some key targets that we have to be able to hit. So we have a revenue resource limit, a capital resource limit, and we are required to achieve a PSPP target. And I'll go into that in a bit more information. But um, it's positive and pleasing to note that we've successfully achieved um, all of these targets for the year 21-22. Um, so the accounts in note 2.1 on page 22 show the revenue resource performance. So we have a statutory duty to ensure that our expenditure doesn't exceed the aggregate, <coughs> excuse me, of our um, allocation from Welsh Government and any um, income that we can generate ourselves. And subject to audit, we achieved that with a £343,000 underspend. Um, so that is a small percentage of our overall allocation, so um, would be deemed a break-even position. Um, in sort of account extract, so note 2.2 on page 22 shows the capital resource limit. So, <laughs> sorry, I can see you, but not the numbers on the screen. That's better. Um, so we had an initial allocation of £100,000. We um, sort of requested a further allocation from Welsh Government because we identified um, additional spend that could be made in support of education and training. And that um, equipment was delivered and we ended the year with a small underspend of £3,000. So again, we are deemed to have achieved a break-even position on that capital resource limit. Um, so... The public sector payments policy, so we're required to pay 95% um, of non-NHS invoices by number, not value, within 30 days of delivery. Um, we achieve that um, by a percentage of 96.8, um, which is a huge amount of work for the team and a lot of people across the organisation. So, um, you know, obviously we're, we're pleased that we were able to report that we achieved that. Um, so where has our resource, <coughs> excuse me, been spent? So in notes 3.1, 3.2 and 3.3 within the accounts, it shows a breakdown um, of our expenditure across the main categories of expenditure that we've got. And this chart is just showing a comparison of the scale of those across um, the two years that are reported in the accounts. But going into that in a little bit more detail, so... The expenditure on non-medical education and training. So the, the bulk of this is spent on student training fees and bursaries um, with you know, a range of other items of expenditure. And I think, as you can see in the charts, we're quite consistent in the pattern of spend across these different areas. And as an improvement in 21-22, we restated the 2021 expenditure across those expenditure headings to better reflect um, how we report that internally through the organisation, but also to enable us to, um, I suppose, tell the story of how we're spending that resource, answer any audit queries, and um, I suppose better reflect um, exactly how we're using that resource in the organisation. Um, Postgraduate uh, medical, dental, and pharmacy education. So the biggest proportion of the spend um, under these budgets is on the training rate salaries for foundation doctors, <clears throat> but also within their GP training. So our sort of training programs for GP registrars and I suppose all of the other um, programs within medical, dental and pharmacy education. But again, very consistent year on year in how we, we're spending that allocation. And then other operating expenditure. Um, so the bulk of expenditure in this category is on staff costs. So that orange um, part of those graphs is operational staff costs. Um, but I suppose all of the other expenditure is categorised in those charts. And again, a lot of consistency in how we are, um, I suppose, reporting this because we're trying to make sure that I suppose we are um, we're reflecting in the accounts as we report it through the organisation and as that actually happens in reality. 
Um, so just moving on to section four, so our property plants and equipment, note 11, page 36. So we purchased assets during the year of 231,000, and this was predominantly um, IT equipment, so laptops, um, but we also purchased 49K of equipment, and that was actually a needle trainer devices. Um, we can give a bit more explanation of that if, um, if you wanted it. And then we disposed of 13K's worth of dental equipment. So our, that's actually the accumulative depreciation, so chargeable of 2.2 million, uh, 1.8 in 2021. Um, and the categorization of our asset type and net book value is on the chart and also the, the movement in net book value. So the additions, disposals and the depreciation in year, giving us a closing net book value of 1.9 million. And on section five, so just, looking at our sort of working capital, so how we are um, dealing with the debtor and creditor position is the, the chart on the left, the accounts extract of note 27 on page 57. So you can see um, our movement in trade and other receivables and trade and other payables, um, which is our debtor and creditor position. And then a small movement in, I suppose, the, the working capital position um, from negative to positive, which actually means that we are, I suppose, we're using our working capital to best effect or trying to use our working capital to best effect. And then the chart on the right is cash and cash equivalent. So our cash balance last year was 6.1 million. Um, we have reduced it really marginally to 5.9. Um, but we have, obviously, we need a balance of cash to be able to service um, those payments that we need to make early in the new year. And then that is just the um, statement of comprehensive net expenditure for the period 2 31st of March 22, um, as it is shown in the accounts on page 2. So that was all I was going to um, take a bit through, so we're happy to take any, any questions on any of that. Thank you, Rihanna. Um, oh, there we are. I've got, this, I've got the screen back now. So um, open it up for, for questions. Can't see any hands. I've, I've just got a couple, which I probably should have um, um, let you know beforehand, um, Rihanna, so apologies. <laughs> um, the, it was just a couple of things that, that struck me, um, and I'll run through this, three questions. Travel has virtually doubled, and I, and I just wondered um, what was um, the reasoning for that, given that we've had a year of um, COVID and less travel. Um, how many more... And I'm not, you probably haven't got the answer in front of you. How many more GP registrars and dental foundation trainees do we have? Because that's another area of expenditure that seems to have varied considerably. Um, and I don't know if I was reading it right. And I know you're going to come on to the remuneration report. Um, but I got a bit confused on um, the increase in admin and clerical because um, if I've read it right, it looks as though we've got an additional 50, which seems quite a considerable increase in admin and clerical. Um, I just wondered, was that reflected, was that consistent with the remuneration report? When I went through that quickly, I couldn't, I couldn't quite see the same figures. So, so sorry, I should have let you know those questions in advance, apologies. Um, I think in terms of travel, um, it depends which item of travel you're looking at. So I think travel and subsistence for staff will have reduced in the last two years. But what we have noticed is travel and subsistence for trainees. So the um, trainees traveling to placements um, to enable them to get to the point of graduation. So we had um, a real step up in trainee travel and subsistence in the last year um, in relation to the previous year because everybody was trying to get those placements in to be able to get them to a point of, um, I suppose, graduation. So if, if what you're picking up is trainee travel and subsistence, 
then yes, I can absolutely um, understand an increase. Um, we've also had an in the DSA payment um, in the last year in comparison to the year before. Um, and a lot of that, I think, is because you know, that attendance or at courses physically is happening again and people are having to travel to you know, those sort of placements and um, I suppose experience points. So I think okay. yes. if that was the point you're picking up, then yes, I can, we can explain that, certainly. Yeah. Um, BP and dental. So we, we've probably talked quite a lot in um, some of the other fora about GP training and yeah. The, yeah. You know, the pipeline and how people are extending the length of training. So um, we have got numbers, input numbers into that system, but it doesn't t tell you the full picture because we've got people taking longer through training and that's the, okay. the increase in expenditure is as a result of that. Um, dental, I know we've got, we've got 65 places for foundation training and then seven of the, um, sorry, I can't remember exactly what they're called, but I know we've had sort of, um, sort of full recruitment into that, but you know, I think the big increases in dental training are because in previous we didn't have that full commissioning budget and we have increased it. So you know, again, we can, we can give you more detail on that. Um, and we have had a significant increase in the number of people in the organization. So do you want to take yeah, it I, I mean, Clara, but, uh, Clara, but it's, it's got a broad group in, but perhaps I can provide a bit of analysis for you separately outside the meeting and forward that on in terms of the areas that, that they are. Um, um, Helen, we got her to ask her this morning and she's quite finishing the working paper on that. So um, that may be helpful if I could send that separately after the meeting. Okay, that, yeah, that would be helpful because it's the sort of area that, that you know, comes to people's attention. So I just want to be sure that, um, you know, that we've, we've done due diligence on it and also that it reconciles. I'm sure Helen will, will check that it reconciles to the remuneration report for us. <laughs> Okay. Um, any more questions on the final accounts? Obviously, um, we know that they're they're subject to audit, and I'm sure there's a lot of uh, focused work going on at, at the moment and um, for the next few weeks. But um, I I guess congratulations really um, to you for getting um, a good clean set of accounts um, out of the door to the Welsh Government on time and also for meeting um, the, the criteria set, um, the three um, criteria that we have to have to meet. So well done to the team and um, hopefully um, you'll be able to pass that on Rhiannon and, and Martin to everybody because I know the amount of work that goes into this and checking and double checking all the figures. Yeah, thank you. And, and actually, it's a uh, it's huge work of work, isn't it? So it's it's in in reporting every month, and then you know, a year end as a another month end, and then a set of accounts. So yeah, very grateful for your thanks, and I will certainly pass it on to the team, and I know they appreciate it. Good, thanks, and um, and hopefully we'll have a, a good audited set by uh, by the month beginning of June. So. Um, Okay, so unless there's anything else, Rhiannon, that you want to say, are you going to move on now, um, you and Martin, to the remuneration report? Yeah, Martin's going to pick this one up. Thank you. Sorry, I should have said the committee's asked to note the draft accounts. We don't have to approve them at this stage. Happy to note, Jonathan? Good. Okay, sorry. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so this, this paper just presents a remuneration staff report for 2021-22 to the audit and this committee for review prior to submission to the Welsh Government, uh, which is due tomorrow. As in a way, the remuneration report is one part of the annual report we require to produce and the requirements are set out in the manual, manual for accounts are quite prescriptive in terms of what we need to provide based on the various uh, guidance and regulations that, uh, that we need to follow. Information to complete this report comes from a number of sources, including the, the people team, workforce, and also finance, probably one of the, uh, the, the, the reports that brings lots of different areas together. I think the format probably is fairly familiar to, to the committee now as the fourth year we've, we've presented this. There aren't any significant changes uh, this year to the report again, so it's fairly consistent. 
I guess the one one area just just to flag up is uh, the remuneration relationship on uh, page two previously was reported in, in this. Um, it's got a lot more complex this year, and it's it's now within the accounts you know, nine point six. So the report has changed slightly, and um, it's it's in there instead of the remuneration report. I guess there are any significant issues I want to raise in the paper. I assume it's been read. I just flag up that once again we are waiting for a response from the civil service pension scheme for information relating to the deputy chief executive. I think it's a, a recurring a joke. I'm not sure it was a joke, but a theme anyway. Uh, the request was submitted at the end of January, which was you know right in the middle of the, of the, of the reporting period, and we were still uh, waiting a response. So I have chased that again this week. So I'm hopeful that that will be with us shortly so we can complete that section. So I'm more than happy to take any questions on the information there, but I'm asking the committee to review the report uh, prior to submission tomorrow, and then it'll go on, on for audit through, uh, through Helen's team. Thank you. Thanks, Martin. Um, you, you've obviously uh, picked up the question that you were expecting me to ask, which is what on earth takes so long to get that information, but um, given that you, you asked in January then, um, is there anything, Helen, from your point of view, um, in terms of audit, um, that that can be done at the Welsh government level, because we can't be the only ones who struggle. Uh, yeah, I might need a bit more. We do ask a question every year, to be honest, Jill, <laughs> and we do um, make noises through our tech team, but it's such a big authority that we don't really have any say in how quick they do these working. So, so fingers crossed, it comes in by the end of the month. Right. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Helen. Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> Jonathan, do you have any comments on the remuneration report? No, I, I, Jill, it's, it's incredibly comprehensive. I was just amazed at the, the level of detail that is that is required by way of yeah. reporting. But, you know, that, that is what we're required to do. And I have no problem, obviously, with that. Um, I'm just conscious that it probably takes staff quite a significant amount of time to pull this information. Uh, together and you know time is valuable I, I, that's not a complaint it's not, it's not a criticism it's just an observation that these exercises do require mm. a, a lot of effort I know we can get into a routine of pulling this information together and somehow that becomes easier to achieve but it is still a lot of data for people to uh, to, to 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 crunch um, can I, can I, Sickness rates, I don't know whether that's something that we want to consider going forward. Yes. I know we've lost quite a yeah. significant number of, well, quite a, quite, a, quite an increase in the number of days, total yeah. days lost um, when looking at the sickness absence uh, data. Um, I don't know if that's out of kilter with what we would expect to see or whether that's um, standard when looking at the types of organisations within the NHS. But obviously, we're a very different organisation to others, but... Um, I, I, again, I don't know if there's something there that we wanted to to consider, not today, but to consider, um, you know, over the next few months, perhaps just to just to look at that and to see whether there's anything that we needed to address as an organisation. But that was just one observation. Yeah, funny enough. It's, there, was um, one, there was one slight error in the report. I think, uh, unless I'm wrong, we've been around for four years, not three years. It mentioned it says three years at the top of page five. So I'm, I'm not I'm not I'm not picky. I'm not the sort of person that proofs read documents particularly well, but it just struck me. I thought I think it's probably an overhang from last year's report, but uh, just just a flag. Yeah. Let's, let's be yeah. let's be confident and say we've been here for four years. Yeah. Um, funny enough, the sickness is the one area that I picked out as well. And I thought we do need to ha have a look at that because it is out of kilter with anywhere else I've worked. OK. Um, in the majority of cases, sickness have gone down. Um, now, whether it had gone down and gone back up, Rhiannon's waving frantically down the end of the table. So, sorry, it was uh, I just um, so there is a there is an NHS target, isn't there, which I think is two four percent. But I suppose just reflecting on the last year, and, and we have been in in a COVID situation still, and whether that has had you know an impact, but I guess it would have had, had an impact the previous year as well. NHS targets. 4.1%. And HAW is 1.8. And coming from a health board, our sickness remains considerably lower than, than other NHS organisations. But I can see the table would indicate the difference, isn't it? And I suppose that's the bit that is drawing attention. But overall, our sickness is very low. Yeah. It is. 
um, but we aren't an NHS sort of board or, or trust, and therefore I would th the comparison with the target I think is probably a bit of a red herring in terms of an NHS target um, because it covers all sorts of different frontline services. I mean, I think we should be comparing ourselves um, with, a, with a slightly more ambitious target. And I think the majority of organisations um, like HEIW sickness went down during, during COVID. Um, so, so I think there is, you know, I think it, it's explained in there about um, it's mainly long term, which is always better. Um, but I think Jonathan's right. I think not for now, but I think um, it's something that we might want to flag up for the, um, for looking out for the future. I mean, you know, I think one thing to flag up, obviously, you know, accepting the fact that we have been in a pandemic, of course. However, these numbers got worse between the first year of the pandemic and the yeah. second year. The pandemic was probably its most intense in, in the yeah. 2020 to 2021 period, not the 21 mm -hmm. to 22 period. Um, it's also perhaps you know internally for the organization to understand you know the nature of of ill health w was that related to potentially people feeling you know under the weather because of some level of mental ill health because of isolation working from home i mean i you know the pandemic has had different types of consequences not just physical mm -hmm. uh, ill health for many many people sadly but obviously uh, mm -hmm. some people have struggled with uh, yeah. remote working uh, being cooped up at home so i think it'd be useful to um, you know, to understand a bit more about it, just to, just a sense check. And I'm you know, not suggesting for one second that the organisation hasn't done everything possible to support the workforce. But for some people, working from home, you know, isn't always the, you know, the wondrous joy that many other people feel that it is. So absolutely. Yeah, yeah. particularly if you haven't got yeah. much space at home to work in. I mean, we're, you know, I'm quite lucky where I am, but uh, other people working out of a, a one or two bed flat, for example, with not much space, you know, don't find working from home to be that uh, much of no. a, a joyful experience. So maybe just understanding a bit more about the reasons for this would be useful, but I think we can probably delve into that yeah. perhaps over the next few months, Jill. Yeah, I think we can um, probably talk to Julie about it. So, okay, um, thank you for that. So, um, um, and thanks again for all the effort, as Jonathan said, that goes into pulling this um, remuneration and staff pay report it does seem to get more extensive every year. And, um, and I know there's a lot of work that goes into it. So again, thanks. And um, we've asked to review it. Um, and I think that's what we, we've done. Okay, so moving on, um, David, the CSIRO report. Okay, so um, I know it is Peter Kumrai. Vetli Pampiri Unodi Erwin Sikruith, the Dihon. Blessed Geni Kumunoda Jolly at Blanadol, Valerie Uch, Bechanogrisk, Gubodeth near Syro, Akever Sunneth. My Rajoth at Syro and Kali Sered in Marverda, Erwin Spussi, Elote, or Heri Aik, Lodreki Gubodeth, Heavy Vodloni, a Pushkar and Mina Kavanyan, Trail Pilio. Um, or am cynnwys yr adroddiad, uh, mae'r adroddiad uh, yn, yn cadnhau, gwelliant parhau scan HIW yn meis sydd uh, cydymffurfiaeth uh, a dedd diogelu data, ynghyd â cynnydd yn maes uh, seibr ddiogelwch. Um, uh, mae o hefyd uh, yn amrelli uh, y cynlluniau yn y meis sydd yma ar gyfer y flwyddyn nesa, uh, felly dan ni'n gofyn i'r Pwyllgor o sgwelwch yn dda i nodi ar y droddiad er gwybodaeth. Sgwelwch yn dda. Dank yw, David. Um, and um, Hugh, thank you. The translation worked. So it's always a, a, a plus. Um, so, um, Jonathan, did you have any, any comments? Th thanks, Chair. Thanks, David. Really, really, really helpful uh, report. And it, it's good to see the list. Uh, uh, of the of the key achievements, in particularly in how you know awareness has been increased, the level of training, um, things like you know development of cyber um, cyber response capabilities, for example. I think or cyber incident uh, response capabilities uh, really important areas for the organisation to focus on. I, I'm just wondering, in terms of you know capturing the impact 
um, obviously really good list of achievements, but then I suppose I go back to that, yeah, so what question. I suppose the so what is it could be an absolute disaster if we don't do this stuff. Um, so it's it's reversing that position from having to act because there's a potential negative. But um, I'm just wondering in terms of how we capture some of that, some of that impacts, I think it's really good for us to, you know, as we're planning for the future and looking at the key priorities that you set for 2022, 23, um, just to be able to say, well, yeah, we did this because this is the impact we we feel that this has had for the organization and people people working here um but and in doing that i suppose thinking about those um uh you know the things that you've set out for 22 23 um are those the sorts of things that other uh, other bodies are doing nhs bodies i mean do we are we able to learn and, and share some of that best practice that we that we see elsewhere because obviously we're part of a of a, of a wider um, uh, NHS family that obviously you know, is going to experience the same sorts of risks and challenges that, that we that we that we face. So I'm just wondering what what are we learning from others, and do we do we take that into account? Okay, that's, um, I'm aware that both the um, uh, in, in terms of uh, areas of cyber, also in terms of information governance, um, that that both uh, of um, the, the both individuals that head up those areas within HIW attend regular peer group meetings, and that they're in regular dialogue. Uh, with their peers across the NHS um, and therefore there's a kind of a cross-pollination if you like of uh, information and best practice from from those areas. Um, a number of our uh, policies and procedures kind of uh, reflect all Wales um, policies so consequently there is that regular dialogue going on to ensure that we do capture best practice and do um, uh, reflect the, the good work that's undertaken across the board and obviously we've also had um, internal audit reports and uh, Wales audit reports in these areas as well, which also helps us to pick up uh, best practice in those areas. Is David on, on impact? Is it, is it hard? Is it a hard one to capture? Because um, in a sense, you, 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 all this is done to prevent something disastrous happening. So, um, and I suppose that 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 is the that, that, that is positive in itself. But it's it, it is. It's it started from a, a very odd position, isn't it? And like most other areas of activity, which is that we're doing this because the positive impact it has on A, B, and C. In essence, you know, work on cyber is to um, is very much around protecting the organisation. So, is is it a difficult one to, to to capture by way of impact? I mean, the, the awareness raising, the training, I suppose, is is yeah. I, I mean, uh, measuring impact, I, I guess, to, you, you, I suppose you need to break it down. So, there's clearly some indicators that reflect as having an impact. For for example, on uh, uh, mandatory training around information governance. Uh, so there's clearly been an increase there, which reflects the, the good work that's been do done there. There's obviously the regular training um, in those areas. Uh, also, there's a separate paper being considered in a moment with regards to um, uh, information governance that, that we've you know, been assessed at, at level two. And I think that does reflect, given the fact that we were, we were assessed at level zero last year um, in, in the area of information governance, I think that does reflect not only all the good work that's been done in that area um, with it by the information governance team, but it does reflect the broader impact within HIW and a, a broader knowledge. Uh, however, we can never be satisfied. It's kind of, we, we need to, to regularly focus on the area and constantly uh, focus on the work that we're doing in that area. And clearly a key area of failure um, in terms of information governance and failing to comply with information governance are individuals. If you look at what's happened um, elsewhere, so clearly it's something that we can never you know stop working upon and just constantly work going forward but i'm very confident given the work that's been undertaken the last three years that we're in a much better place than we were you know a year, a year ago two years ago and certainly so doesn't compare to where we were three years ago when we were established yeah and thank thank you for the report it was really really comprehensive uh, th thanks thank you chair thanks thank you. Very good questions there. Um, the, um, the committee's asked to note the report for assurance. So, um, yes, duly noted. Thank you. Okay, um, David, moving on to the audit committee annual report. Uh, yes, so um, I'm having. Oh. Was it something I said? <laughs> Impact chair. Yeah. Is this what I'll be wary of? <laughs> okay. So David seems to have uh, vacated his seat at the moment. So, all right. Shall we? Again, this report it, 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 it reads really well, and uh, yeah, clearly demonstrates the 
you know, the impact and the role of the, the committee. Obviously, I don't feel as though I can really comment on the, the 12 yeah. months to the uh, to the 31st of March of this year, because I was only yeah. appointed to the committee on the 31st of March of this year. So for that one day, uh, I can say quite confidently for that one day, right at the end of this period, uh, that uh, things certainly uh, we're looking at. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, John. I, I can't comment helpful. on the, the 364 days before that. <laughs> Most helpful. And I know following the last audit committee, I know um, that Ruth has contributed um, certainly to the um, self-assessment. So um, subject to um, other, other comments, um, I think we can take this report as, um, as, as Julie noted. Um, and are we happy to... Um, approve for submission to the board. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Fabulous. Okay. I've got no idea where um, David's disappeared to, so we'll move on. Um, general digital update and quite a few um, digital um, um, issues um, to go through. So if I hand over here to Sean, perhaps you could take us through these. Um, yeah, it, it does link back to some of the assurance that we received in the earlier part of the report. And I think this is our placeholder now to bring you more formal updates and to have a place on the agenda um, for probably quarterly updates in relation to digital. Um, That'd be great. Yeah. Um, then um, big um, two big key things that I just wanted to share with you is that we finished our um, departmental and strategic objectives in a green status. Um, there's been considerable achievements and improvements from a digital perspective um, in delivering that in for the year 21-22. Um, um, during that time, um, as some colleagues will be aware, we've um, successfully transitioned um, the majority of our um, systems and applications to the cloud. Um, this is a first um, for this type of deployment in NHS Wales for this type of um, these systems. We have been um, using um, strategic partners to support us on that journey. Being a small team, we've done that in order to enhance our internal learning, but ensure that we're at the cutting edge of best practice because some of this is um, new and slightly uncharted waters, but also um, thinking back into the governance around digital directors and DHCW to ensure that we're aligned with NHS Wales direction of travel um, in that and the Welsh Government policy of cloud first. So um, I think the team have made an extraordinary um, uh, uh, pace and scale to achieve that and um, just to put on the record my thanks to them for that achievement. Um, in terms of impact, I think Johnson's questions were around some of that. I think this gives us the opportunity to offer um, a safe, available, scalable platform for our staff and our trainees in particular. In the first instance, that's the, the majority of our digital offering is geared towards them. And I think it's a foundation step in stone then for our digital strategy that will be delivered over the next um, 12 months, ready for March 2023. Um, and obviously, um, that's in development and we will have opportunities to engage on that strategy and I see audit committee as part of that engagement process chair if you would be uh, willing to be cited and involved in that engagement of the strategy. Absolutely. Great, thank you. That was it for today and, and next time a more formal update and maybe a written form so that we've got some progress being monitored. Okay, lovely. Thank, thank you very much, Sean. Jonathan, did you want to comments nothing for me thank you thank you chair um re re really encouraging to see the the progress that's been made so again congratulations to the team and you know some of this can go dreadfully wrong sometimes in organizations but clearly you know this has been really well led and um you know excellent to see the impact and i think i want to endorse that because um having been on the journey from the beginning i think at the audit committee where we we came from a real standing start if not behind the, <laughs> the start um i'm absolutely delighted sean with all the progress that's being, being made on this i mean it's a really exciting journey um i know there's tons of work that's gone on and um accept that you, you you've had sort of half you know half a team which has now become a, a, a lot you know a lot more populated let's say um giving you an opportunity i guess to progress some of these things but um but really delighted so can can we pass on formally 
and thanks to the audit committee we are in such a better place than than we were um a couple of years ago so so thanks to the team okay um do you want to cover anything in the information governance toolkit submission um i i would assume the paper has been read um so just a really high level overview um the, the committee will be aware that when we did this voluntary the toolkit submission to nhs wales last year um we um had um a level zero compliance rating and demonstrated the work that was required um, as a result, we um, developed a um, action plan um, with some resources to support the team and engagement across the organisation. Um, and as a result of the fruition of that plan, and I must say a lot of hard work um, and um, coordination by our IG manager, Emma, we have now submitted a, a level two um, submission, which um, broadly calculates as a 40% increase in compliance score. It is, it's weighted and there are some things um, that we're not um, uh, required to um, submit, uh, but that is demonstrated. The paper describes the improvement and the work that's been done. It also gives a comprehensive overview of um, the different levels uh, that is required. And as we've rehearsed previously in this meeting, if you don't hit level two um, for that, or at least then you don't achieve it overall by the nature of the score. Um, but as you can see, um, we submitted areas with evidence of a level two, or in some areas, a level three, which also describes um, great progress. Um, and just a thanks, really, because there's a lot of effort that's gone in, not just by the IG team, but right across the directorates and that co-working. And during this period as well, our information governance and IA, the IGIM, um, which reports this group has been strengthened with directorate representation. So I think now for our platform moving forward, we're further going to be able to take this work forward. So um, we're not stopping there. Um, a revised plan is now being drafted for 22-23. Um, and some of this now will be further tightening up in these areas and taking this work forward. Um, but I'm hoping that the committee will be assured by the progress that's being made. Thanks. Thanks very much, Sean. Jonathan? Just, just very quickly, Chair, if I can. Um, Obviously, there's been, as you said, an increase in the compliance score compared to last year's submission. And you've outlined you know, a, range of, uh, a range of work uh, in the past um, 12 months that you know focus on those sort of key information governance areas. I'm just wondering from your perspective, which which act which actions or activities do you think have had the the, the biggest impact? I think a couple actually. General awareness raising, there's definitely a different in perception of the importance and the role that information governance plays um, within the organization. I think our um, having our governance and our processes and, and our procedures in place have, has made a difference to the organisation. Um, training um, and the constant improvement in the information asset register, because that forms a basis actually then of some of the work that we take forward. Getting the audit programme up and running was a big step. I think that's the area, and I was discussing this yesterday with Emma, for further improvement now through this year and to really close the loop from the um, policy procedures, the audit back into um, how well we're doing and further action plans. So I think this area is a classic for continuous improvement really uh, around this area of work. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, Chair. Oh, thank you. Um, and thanks very much again, Sean, for, for all the work. I mean, it, you, you did touch on uh, something that has occurred to me that it is continuous improvement and it's very difficult to know when you've got there <clears throat> i would suggest on this uh, as things move on we you know you, you end up chasing your tail almost don't you on this but i mean we we are you know sort of making real huge significant progress chunks as i call them um certainly moving towards level two and hopefully um, that's what will be agreed is is a huge step forward, but I guess it, this will never be finished. <laughs> um, okay, so um, we're asked to <coughs> note the submission of the toolkit to DHCW. When, Sean, when, when did, does that go off? Has it gone off? 
gone. It went at the end of March. Um, we I had thought it did. Yeah. yeah. On whether that was the final report. And do we know when we'll hear? Well, we don't at the moment. Last year it was a, it was middle to end of May. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, note that the organisation um, has been identified as achieving level two compliance and we're obviously delighted with that and the progress and um, the work that the teams put in um, and note that a delivery plan will be delivered from this submission and obviously we'll take a keen interest in that um, at the audit committee so happy with those Jonathan? Yes sir, yep. thank you Chair. Good, thank you. Okay, moving on um, to the annual counter fraud work plan. And um, welcome, Jonathan, to your, um, uh, Jonathan, Gareth, <laughs> to your second meeting um, of the audit committee. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'll be very brief. Essentially, the counter fraud plan has now been approved by uh, myself or agreed by myself and Rhiannon. Um, it sets out the work that I plan for myself and my team for the upcoming year. Obviously, it's slightly different to previous years in as much as the Counter Fraud Authority have changed um, the standard requirements that, um, uh, that we have to achieve throughout the year. So there are now 12 new requirements as opposed to the old four. So it's written in that format. It's quite broad and it's quite flexible and that's intended Due to the nature of the work, um, things can change throughout the year and we have to sort of react to obviously investigations, but also um, locally identified risks and things like that. So it is quite a broad plan, but um, and it is quite a challenging plan to meet, but I do think it's achievable. Coming out of um, the COVID situation now, there are lots, there's a lot of work to be done to sort of uh, make improvements with regards to things like awareness, education, um, identity, reporting routes, policy reviews, all sorts of things, um, which we've already made a start on and obviously will be reported at, uh, at the next meeting in our progress report. And obviously all this will be measured at the end of the year against our annual report and the um, functional standards. So we'll see how we get on by then, but I'm anticipating that we can achieve what's in it. Um, and if anybody's had a chance to read it thus far, I'm quite happy to take any questions that they might wish to pose. Oh, I should add as well, sorry, that the annual report that is due, I'm still playing catch up, obviously. So that will be presented at the next meeting along with the um, counter fraud um, progress report. Okay, thank you, Gareth. Thanks, I was going to ask about that. That's great. Jonathan, any, uh, any thoughts? Thanks, Chair. Gareth, thanks for the uh, the plan. Uh, just my own information, I suppose, just because uh, being new to um, to an NHS body, are, are we required, or rather, are you required every year uh, as part of this work to examine each of the the twelve uh, NHS requirements? Um, and I'm just wondering if if that is the case, um, how how do you decide? How do you make the judgment as to where to prioritise? Yeah. Um, the work because it covers it covers off quite a significant number of areas. Oh yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. It's quite yeah. comprehensive. I I think in answer to that, the easiest way to put it is the situation we're in at the moment is slightly different because firstly the functional standards are new and they've just been put in place or they came in to force last year actually, but they they're only going to be required from this year going forward. So there's a great deal of change this year in years going forward from here. There's a lot in there that it's sort of infrastructure development, really. And once that infrastructure is in place now over the next, I'm hoping to get most of that done in the first couple of quarters, then that will roll on year after year. And then things will change only slightly year on year. Then it'll be things like a policy is due for review in three years and, and those sorts of things. But the, the majority of it will remain the same with regards to... Um, most of the work the the actual way we carry it out will change al along with things that change in the organization so digital improvements and things will obviously improve our ability to communicate better with staff and things but that's something that we can address as we go along and obviously risk assessments they they're required to be locally informed so anything that comes up at a particular time we carry that out um in reaction to that, if you like, if, if that makes sense. Um, 
And yes, we are required to report to the Counter Fraud Authority every year. That's due in by June the 10th now due to technical issues. So that report um, will measure us in, this, in a similar vein to um, risk matrix, matrices used elsewhere on red, green and amber, whether we're achieving these things. But I'm quite hopeful we can, we can be um, hitting mostly greens by this time next year. Looking at the, um, the individual requirements, which, which ones do you think cause us the greatest level of risk or headache, potentially? Um, well, the risks, the risks for us fraud, with regards to fraud, we, we really rely on the organisation to sort of report. We, we sort of meet with the organisation to identify those. I think the key things for us, I think the key things for us going forward, certainly for me, um, are, are in order to, to sort of prevent those things in the first place are obviously awareness and education is key. I'm aware that Nigel has arranged, for example, for staff to be mandated to undertake fraud training as corporate induction. One of the things on my list is to make sure, well, to attempt at least to make the fraud e-learning package mandatory for staff, which is always a difficult hurdle. Um, and really getting communication out there to, to um, staff of the organization that we exist and we what we're here for and that they can feel confident in coming to us. When it comes to the actual risks posed by sort of system weaknesses and things like that, we generally act upon those and use the sort of government methodology to report back to relevant departments on remedies that can be made. And then that will be reported back through this committee, if you like, to say that those things have been or asked to be undertaken and whether or not they are then is obviously down to that particular department. I'm not sure if that answers your question fully, but... Yeah, that's, that's really helpful, actually. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Gareth. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Jonathan. It's funny enough, I, as you were um, talking, I was thinking it might be useful, Gareth, for you to pick that up um, throughout the year in identifying a little bit clearer what the specific risks are for our Yeah, this, just to clarify that, we are slightly different with regards to internal audit. We're, we're and forgive me if I'm mistaken in this, but my understanding is with internal audit, they will identify certain risks that they will undertake audit upon throughout the, an upcoming year. Our risk work doesn't quite work like that. And our risk work is um, generated either by something that we locally identify as we go through the year. So it could be, for example, with regards to HIW, we are currently, I'm just at, at the inception stage of a risk assessment with regards to student bursary. And that's been informed through a couple of referrals that we've had for investigations. And that's how our risk process works. It's not so much that we set out at the start of the year and say, we're going to do a risk assessment into this, 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 and this. It's more of a, whilst it's a proactive exercise, it's more of a reactive um, generation, if you like, um, from, from what we've either learned internally from the organization or possibly from other organizations that we are, react to that's happening there. That's generally how it works. So. I'm not really in a position at the start of the year in the plan to highlight risk areas that we're going to be looking at because it would be uh, contrary to what the Counter Fraud Authority wishes to do, if you like. Okay. Um, and something that I guess um, difficult for you, but I, I think from our point of view, certainly um, it would be very useful for the proactive. Bit. So I guess perhaps you could feed back that that you know we we don't just want reactive. We would quite like oh. risk assessments. Um, and I I know sometimes that you, your hands are tied um, with with uh, that's something that has bemused me. Let's say for for many years, Gareth, about the <laughs> um, the, the counter fraud service. But but I think. I think Jonathan's question is something you might want to reflect on and, and take back, which is, you know, how do we tailor, and Rhiannon may want to comment, how do we tailor our counter-fraud days 
in a way that's um, minimizing the risk to the organization. So uh, it might be something that you want to just reflect on and, and, um, and chat through with Rianne on. Yeah, that's fine. I, I reiterate though, um, Chair, if I might, might that um, we do address risk. We, we address it as, it as it arises or as it's reported to us. So I'm not suggesting that we only undertake an investigation and then do a risk assessment. It might be born out of something else. It might be born out of a fraud prevention notice issued by the counter fraud authority. What I'm saying is, is that we don't, what we don't do is essentially pick an area within the organization and say, we are simply going to do a proactive exercise into the fraud risk in that department when there is no basis for it because nothing has happened. And that, that is the way that we are guided by the County Fraud Authority. And that's how I, I have to report to them. So I understand where you're coming from when you say you, you wish for that to take place, but um, there has to be a sound basis for me to undertake that. So if you have identified that there are weaknesses within a certain area and you feel that they are pr producing the opportunity for fraud to take place, then we can react to that. But they would need to be identified for a reason and then passed to us, if you see what I mean. We, we wouldn't, I wouldn't just pluck an area out of the organization and say, right, we're, gonna, we're just going to see how, how strong the systems are. Perhaps it's something that we can pick up in a, a conversation offline then, um, perhaps, because you know, I know, Jonathan, um, it'd be good for you to meet with, with Gareth and, and certainly if he haven't, um, has an opportunity yet to have a one-to-one, -one, Gareth, so perhaps we can pick that up no at the meeting and have a conversation. David, did you want to come in? Because i got a couple of questions on the, the plan as well. Um, yeah, yes, please. So while, while I'm hearing what, what Gareth is saying, I, I guess... Um, what we're trying to say, and to, just to support uh, Bill's point, is that HIW is very different from uh, any, or any, any health trust. Um, and our concern is that it's quite important that the counter fraud team understand what those differences are. Yep. Now that we're moving into our, our fourth year, uh, the concern is that you know we're, we're just being treated like another health board or another health trust. And I think that it's quite key that counter fraud do understand the nature of our business and consequently that you know that the approach that you take is tailored uh, for HIW and I think that that needs to reflect an ongoing dialogue with, with ourselves and with, with counter fraud and um, I, I take on board what you're saying with regards to the direction that you're getting in, in terms of counter fraud as, as a whole but nevertheless we are you know we, we are the, we are the client and um, it, it, the, the work that you undertake does need to tailor and reflect the, the needs and requirements of HIW. Uh, but I, I think it's a balance. Yeah, I, I take that on board. And um, I have requested meetings with um, certain personnel from your organisation in order to address that. But I haven't been able to get a meeting as yet, David. OK, thank you, Gareth. OK, so we'll we'll make sure that we've got the meetings. If I could come back to the um, the plan itself, um, Gareth. I, and um, these are just observations, but they may well be, it may be that I've missed them. I could see extensive liaison um, or liaison with internal audit, but I couldn't put my finger on the extent of the liaison with audit Wales and external audit in the plan. Um, but it may well be in there. No, it's, I, well, the, 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 it, I do believe it's written in there for, for liaison with audit Wales. Generally, um, I would say that we probably don't liaise that much with Audit Wales on a one-to-one -one basis. Right, okay. Well, that might, might be something we'll pick up in a meeting then. Um, and um, I couldn't find, I could only find very brief mention on NFI, which again um, would, would play to the same sort of point about liaise. Well, yeah, I mean, NFI, there, there's, from my perspective with regards to NFI, when the national exercise comes out, we undertake all the NFI work um, that is yeah, really it, it, it didn't that. strike me that um, it wasn't developed enough in that for me because we're into that year coming up now. So I just wondered if you could well, 
reflect the plan going time. forward the my understanding is the matches are complete for the last um the, the the last period of nfi and the next period of nfi i'm not sure it's going to come out within the period of this annual plan yes it will okay it will. in 2022 well, well then in that case chair as per normal i i do believe nfi was mentioned in the plan but we will carry on conducting our nfi checks as as um we we always do okay so perhaps just a bit of clarity if you could think about that um in there um and I, this, this is a really trivial point, and I look to David um, perhaps for, for advice here, but the font um, of the report is incredibly tiny, and this is a public paper, and I just wondered whether we had, we, it was accessible for everybody, David. It's, 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 it's minute, the font, um, and I know it's a a sort of slightly bizarre point, but I, it just struck me as I was going through the papers that I, as it was a public paper, whether um, it was in a form that was um, um, was accessible. No, clearly it does need to be accessible. I'll, 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 I'll check that. We've got um, obviously guidance around ensuring yeah. that it's using the correct font sizes, um, and I will uh, make sure that we'll, that we'll share that information. Okay. So, um, from my point of view, the plan sent, the font size is, is at 12, so I'm not okay. quite sure why it's... We'll, uh, we'll, we'll have a look at that, we'll make sure... Oh, that, doesn't uh, look anything we'll, like 12 on there. Uh, sometimes admin control can have a, an impact, but so uh, obviously in terms of right. on the web, I'll just make sure that, um, that, yeah. that, that font size is reflected as 12, yeah. if it is accessible to everybody. Okay, so um, there's quite a few points that have been made on the plan, so... Um, Perhaps, Gareth, you could um, take those away and um, we can certainly pick those up in, in meetings um, with yourself, if that's OK. Right. So, so subject to those, um, committees asked to approve the counter fraud plan. So subject to any changes that we've, we've asked for. Are you happy with that, Jonathan? Yeah. OK, thank you. OK, so... Um, Moving on to part three of the agenda for information, um, taking care of the carers report. This is the management responses. Um, David, I wasn't certain whether anybody was coming to talk to this or whether it's just for us to note the management response. The, the paper is for noting. I could give a brief um, overview. Becky, Papiri Nordi di Hon. Uh, or an chemdir, my um, uh, cynnwys a mateb, um, in a mateb priolu ni, i'r adroddiad ar chwilio Cymru ar gofalu am gofalwyr. Um, roedd adroddiad um, ar chwilio Cymru yn disgrifio sut naeth cyrff y gwasanaeth iechyd, y mateb ag edrych ar ôl lle staff yn ystod yr argyfwng um, COVID-19. Uh, gwnaeth adroddiad ar chwilio Cymru wneud Nifer o ar gymhellion, wyth ar gymhelliad i gyd, chwech ohonynt yn ymwneud gyda um, addysg iechyd, uh, addysg iechyd a gwella Cymru, agig. Um, ac um, mae teb yr rheoli i'w gael uh, yn, yn y papur. Um, mae'n gyfle ni am y nelly rôl llwaith da ni wedi wneud o ran lles uh, yn gweithlu ni a'n cynllun ar gyfer y dyfodol hefyd. Uh, felly papur i'w nodi ydy hon, a ffes i'n derbyn i'n rhywadau o papur i'w nodi ydy. Ok, thank, thank you David for that um, introduction. Jonathan, did you have anything on the paper? Thanks, David. That's really, really helpful. I'm just... Uh, just, just wondering, is, is, does Audit Wales give a view as to whether they believe the responses were robust enough? I'm not suggesting that it isn't, by the way. Um, there's, <laughs> there's a lot that you have included in there. I, I, I'm really happy with what, what's in there as well. It's, it, I mean, it, it's so fundamentally important. Um, so you know, maintaining the focus on these sorts of activities and reviewing what's working well, what isn't working well, where the gaps are, is really important. I'm just wondering, are, are Audit Wales happy? Because you're responding, obviously, to their report and uh, they're expecting everybody to... Uh, to jump through hoops, I suspect. Lavisha, did you want to come yeah, in? I can say that. Um, I mean, I think we recognise that the um, that the response 
takes into consideration the activities that HEIW takes to maintain the well-being of its own staff as well as its wider NHS remit. Um, and from our point of view, I think it's encouraging the commitment to incorporate the board member checklist into the health and well-being framework so that the board can have maintain a kind of an overview on well-being activities. So um, yeah, we're happy with the response. Okay, thanks for that. Sorry to put you on the spot. Um, my question really was how are we going to monitor it? Will you be following up um, as Audit Wales or um, will it come through on the tracker? Davis, um, in terms of monitoring our progress? I was assuming that it'd be part of your tracker, but Davis might, yeah, I think that's the way it's been done at the health bodies. Yes, so, yes it's, it, it's standard practice. We will we'll pick up on the, uh, on the track. Uh, so we'll be coming back uh, to the committee. Yeah, okay, lovely. So thank you for that. Um, committee is asked to note the report and the attached management response. You're content, Jonathan? Good, okay, thank you. Um, so that brings us to um, the close of the meeting. Does anybody have any other business? I haven't had anything notified to me. Um, so with that, the date of the next meeting is Friday the 10th of June for the final accounts at 10 a.m. via Zoom. Um, or in the meeting room at Tea Dusky. So um, <clears throat> happy for um, the audit committee meetings to continue on a hybrid basis. Um, so however it suits people to join is fine. So, so with that, um, I'll close the meeting and um, join the closed meeting um, in a few minutes. Thank you, everybody. Bye everyone.